think that there's a lot of fear. I feel like everybody thought the market was crashing six or eight months ago. How many clients did you talk to that said, we're going to wait because they believe prices are going to come down so much? Trying to take more of a long-term approach to this business more than ever than I have. And I always do that, but I think now more than ever, it's important for us to do that, to make sure that we're not putting our clients in a short-term financial situation that we gave them bad advice on. The home values today in June of 2023, for most places, they don't appear to be down. Do you and think they'll continue to go up? Yeah, I, I really do. Over the next six, 12 months? Yes. Andy Burton, Waterstone Mortgage, welcome back. Uh, I know I had you on probably about a year ago, actually, to the date, and uh, everybody heard your incredible story and journey, and that was exciting. Uh, but today I want to talk 100% about the market, the economy. Uh, you bring a lot of really good insight from, from your background and your business, and I, I hopefully can bring some of the same and just want to have some dialogue about what's happening in this crazy market, right? There's just really uncertain and it's really complex, I think. It's probably a good word right now. I think probably been a good thing for people like you and I because we're professionals and our, we know how to navigate, you know, these, the confusing times, I think. <laughs> um, but what are you seeing out there? Are you seeing, um, obviously, where are rates today? High sixes. High sixes. Okay, yep. maybe touching seven. Yep, depending okay. on the scenario. You know, we all had this May 10th date where they were supposed to go down and that didn't happen and they went up. <laughs> that didn't um, work. So I don't think anybody can predict uh, that anymore. But what are you, what are you kind of seeing? What are you guiding your, your buyers on right now? Are you telling them to to wait, to buy, they're doing arms, what's kind of the trend right now? Well, like overall guidance related to interest rates right now, it's the biggest thing. And the honestly, what we see now more than ever is just not more than ever, more than the last 10 years is just rate volatility of rates moving quite a bit up and down, where in the last, I'd say five years or so, you know, someone would get quoted a rate and it was pretty, pretty steady for that. And right now we've seen in the last six months, rate volatility, you know, go up a half or three quarters of a point in mm -hmm. a day, drop mm -hmm. a half or three quarters of a point in a day. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's more volatile than it has been in a long time. So we always want to make sure that the consumer is aware of that and you build that into your budget. Um, so that's a big thing that has changed, you know, that wasn't there and it's driven really by the federal government actually. Let's just expand on that a little bit. I know you can't predict, that's the wrong thing, but I mean, what's your gut and what's your research and your 20 plus years of experience in the industry telling you is going to happen over the second half of this year with rates? Next six months is really difficult to be able to predict. I think it's probably easier to paint out like 18 months to 24 months, but really? um, yeah, I think in the next six months, rates are going to stay the same or slightly decline. Okay. R relying on economists that I'm right. hearing from that they're all implying like we should see a decline in rates. But like you said, May 10th was the date for inflation we thought was going to be big, but there's been big changes that happened from when that was originally predicted, like this SVB bank failures. There's other things that came into play that weren't expected like Bank of Canada raised rates today unexpectedly. So what did that do? Put volatility in the bond market today. And that was an unexpected thing to happen. All of a sudden, what did it do to rates? Bumped them up a little bit today. So there's just interesting things that are happening right now. So it's really hard to predict. But I think that we're at probably a ceiling. It's just how low are they going to go down from here, which is actually easier to advise people on. Yeah. That it's like, hey, if we think this is the top end, right? let's hope that it might come down for you. So, I mean, as a buyer, I can pretty much say, you know, I, this for me should probably be the, the, the highest I'll have to pay per month over the next two years with the hopes that I can refi into something that's a little bit more. Well, if you're looking for a prediction, I was just reading through the Mortgage Bankers Association most recent forecast. And I believe the last one I saw posted was for May of 2023, looking forward all the way out. I was looking kind of farther out, like fourth quarter of 2024. Oh, wow. And their predictions by then would be the average 30-year fixed mortgage rate would be about 4.7%. Really? So that's be substantial. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. Historically, we see rates come down in election yeah. years yep. as well. Kind Everything of comes down and gets yeah. better, right? Yeah. Funny how that works. <laughs> Somehow the stock market goes up and rates come down. COVID goes away. Yep. It'll all happen. Yep. And, uh, but inflation's the underlying driver of rates, which is the underlying issue besides uh, inventory, which is partially driving 
that, rates are driving low inventory. It's all driven by inflation. As we start to see inflation come down, it should improve rates. And a big thing that is different is the federal government was doing quantitative easing for like 10, 12 years. Mm -hmm. So they were controlling the rate market. Mm -hmm. If the rate market got unstable, they would buy more bonds. And by them buying more bonds or printing money, it caused rates to come down or to control rates so they wouldn't be really volatile like they are right now. Well, the federal government has exited that plan, and that has really caused a lot of this volatility right now. I also kind of feel like they're reloading the gun for the ability for future recession to be able to have a, a tool that when we do have a recession to be able to bring rates back down to. If they kept rates down too low for too long, they would not have an ability to be able to help stimulate the economy when there is a recession in the future. So that's a, that's a good, so you say when when we get to a recession, I think we're in a recession. I don't know how to, I mean, what is it, uh, two quarters of negative GB, GDP, which we saw, what, third and fourth quarter of last year? Am I correct in saying that? I don't, you know, I sometimes I just keep my head down and just sell real estate and try not to focus on, you know, the, the media and what's happening. But I mean, uh, at the end of the day, I think we've met to the definition of a recession, haven't we? Yes, but then it's very manipulated right now. Yeah. And then it's not acknowledged, which is like the first time in history, which is really weird. <laughs> not acknowledged by the media. Right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. Which is interesting. Yeah, yeah or the government. Yep. Yeah. And it's also chose to not acknowledge yeah. that, which yeah. is different. Yeah. So are you seeing buyers now get into more unique loan programs than you were in the past, or rather than just 30 year traditional fixed rates? Are you seeing more arms and things of sort like that? Yeah, we the, there's definitely arm product programs that are out there. there. The challenge with ARMS in today's market is they're not readily available to the consumer. And right now there's still less than 10% of all loans that are originated. So there's a fear for a lot of people related to an ARM because they have a friend or family member back in the 2008 financial crash and when they really did a subprime loan. Mm -hmm. And then they correlate a conventional ARM in today's market to the same as what their family or friend did and they lost their home because it had adjusted aggressively, which that's not the case for today's arms. Yeah. But there's not as many arms as you would think. Okay. They're, they're typically driven towards higher loan amounts and they're typically driven towards jumbo loans. And it's not as much as you'd think. But in terms of unique products, I think right now it's I would look at it more as we're advising on a whole different level than we were in the past of really digging into the consumer's finances to be able to help put them in a position to win for a less affordable home than a few years ago when it was ultra affordable, which yeah. is a really hard comparison, honestly. Right. What are you seeing in housing out there? I mean, right now, I mean, I'm just looking at some of this data I pulled this morning. Uh, days on market has doubled in the last... 12 months. Um, showings per listing has been cut in half. We're down from uh, about 12 showings per listing to about, well, less than six. Um, homes for sale is up, um, you know, probably 30% right now. Um, just right here in Washington County, closed sales are down 40%. Um, new listings are, according to the county, down 21%. Median sales price is down 3%. My industry continues to say that housing is going to continue to go up and offset um, any recession that we go into. And I'm just not as is confident maybe uh, in making that statement right now. What What's your opinion? What are you seeing? What are you hearing out there? Specifically in the Twin Cities? Just housing specifically to the Twin Cities. Yeah, yeah. I think Twin Cities, uh, if I'm seeing that, that's for April. Is that, that was right? April, yeah. May hasn't yep. come out yet. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so May numbers look better, you know, and that's a national trend. So nationally, 95% of all uh, major housing markets are seeing an increase in sales right now which is a positive thing. So the trend of some markets we're seeing depreciation that has ended in 95% of all major markets right now, which I thought was an interesting stat I just heard yesterday, mm -hmm. where the Twin Cities Metro, though we didn't have this reduction in price from what I can see, and it doesn't seem like the data supports it either. We had a stagnant market that started to happen in probably November, October, but also we had a seasonal slowdown at the same time, which is normal for our market. Mm -hmm. Historically here, you always can buy a home for a little bit cheaper yeah. in the wintertime right. than you can in, yep. say, what, March through July. Right. Typically seems to be peak pending price. Uh, 
So there's definitely less buyers out there. Uh, I, you, you can't ignore that, but it is increasing, I would say, right now. Uh, you know, part of that is me watching data, and part of that is just my own clientele. Yeah. Like, I've seen how many more people are looking at homes right now. It seems to be increasing. It's tough to compare when you're coming off, like, the hottest numbers of right, all time. Right, right. I will say it's really, and you probably see this on the listing side, it's really spotty mm -hmm. that some houses are crazy hot. Mm -hmm. I just had one this weekend. We had a client offer seventy five grand over list, no contingencies, no financing, appraisal, home inspection, anything, and they didn't get it. Seventy five over what kind of price point? Four ninety nine nine. Crazy. Western Wisconsin. Do you know how many offers? Eighteen. That's crazy. They, yeah, they didn't get it. Do you know? Do you have any idea why they didn't get it? Like what beat them? Uh, price. Just price. Yeah, I think they were like number. F six maybe no you know kidding. they didn't even make it in the top five i don't believe was there something like unique about this property that it was just a very well kept rambler home with a detached garage wooded lot and huh. uh outlying area you know um and those outlying areas is really interesting how m much demand the farther you get out of the metro and how much that has changed yeah. right like where um areas that were less desirable pre-covid now that there's high-speed internet yeah. and if you can work from home yeah. all of a sudden you can go from woodbury in your six hundred thousand dollar home which would either be what 90s or early 2000s Tear downs. no <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah or yeah. a new construction right, right that doesn't have much for landscaping yeah right or you go out what is that half hour from here yeah. 35 minutes and all of a sudden your wooded lot rambler detached garage i mean it sounds pretty attractive if, yeah you know, on the two options. But ultimately what we're really getting at is that it's really spotty where really well-priced houses are still going into multiples, but then there's kind of all the other homes that seem to, there still seems to be a lot going off the market right away. And then you have, it's almost, tell me if you feel this, it's like half go fast and half sit. Yeah, it's almost, it's almost like a, just a, like you said, just a divide there. And sometimes I can't figure out why. I'll list a home that I think is priced really well in a great neighborhood, in good condition, and it will sit for two weeks. And I'll see something out there that isn't in such a great neighborhood, isn't in such great condition, we'll get four or five offers on it. So it's I, I it's confusing. I, don't, I mean, I don't know what to... A lot of it's price point driven, right? I mean, I, st I still think maybe I'm wrong. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the the... The millennials are taking up the majority of the buying population right now, and they're the ones that need a house. So, and they're buying that stuff under probably six. So that segment, at least on my side of town, that segment of the market is probably the hottest. And I think once you jump from six to that six to eight range, that buyer was somebody that was moving from their four house to that 750 house for almost the same mortgage payment a year ago or a year and a half ago, whatever it was. They're gone. They just they just they're not moving because they're they're locked in at that three and a half percent interest rate. They're just not doing that move up buyer has pretty much dried up. So a lot of first time home buyers I'm seeing, maybe you're seeing something else, but it's very segmented. I don't I don't know what I, this is one of the most confusing times and one of the hardest times for me to price a home that I've probably ever seen. Because we went off from one of the highest highs a year ago to a very low low. And like you said in November of last year, home prices dropped locally here ten to fifteen percent in some areas from that high high. Was that a false peak? Maybe, um, but you know, they sellers still had that taste in their mouth of, well, my neighbor's got this, right? My neighbor's got that. So it's hard for me to get the COVID market out and figure out where we are today. It's tough. So, and I think it's confusing for consumers. It's confusing for just everybody right now. I think it's, I think complex is probably the best way to put this market. We got to be the lighthouse right now. Right. right? Like. Uh, for our clients and be that beacon of light of showing them how to be able to do it. And I think that there's a lot of fear. I feel like everybody thought the market was crashing mm -hmm. six or eight months ago. At the, you know, how many clients did you talk to that said, we're going to wait because they believe prices are going to come down so much? But it kind of did crash. I mean, we did have a, a short term crash. I mean, if you bought a home fourth quarter of last year, I think you bought it on sale. There was just a sale. You kind mm -hmm. of said the same thing. We went into an off season. I think there was a short time frame where their homes went on sale. And now we're trying to recoup some of that. Especially new construction. Yeah. Yeah. So it really seemed like, you know, a builders built at that peak price mm -hmm. and they were sitting on inventory. So they really incentivized. There was some fear driven by them that they want to move on 
from that inventory, but and they also make money building homes. Mm-hmm. So they had to move on to the next product. Mm-hmm. So then they were slashing. I mm-hmm. saw some big. I feel like some of them I saw come down twenty percent. It seems like that some of the new construction. Yeah, yeah. It seems like that ship has sailed. That that inventory is now gone. Yeah, yeah. But you never know when that next opportunity on that is, or a builder maybe um, is sitting on a product that they still want to move. There's going to be some good buys still. A lot of those builders fourth quarter of last year they took their what we call inventory homes in the business homes that they they built to sell some people call them spec homes quick builds whatever you want to call them and put them into rentals because they didn't want to sell them at a discount so i know there's some builders locally here that took a dozen or so homes and decided to rent them because they didn't want to sell you know home for 75 cents on the dollar last fall so um i don't know if you saw any of that but i know i a few builders did that so there was a lot of that mm-hmm. i think that went on for quite a bit which it could have been with the 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 demand of rent right now yeah. could have been a great move for them as long as they got the capital. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, are you seeing, so when someone is coming to you right now and this is a, the common move up buyer, like, are you seeing the challenge with them where they come to you and say, you know, I have my $400,000 home, you know, it is time, you know, like I got a new job, I had another kid, you know, whatever it would be that there's a reason for them to move up. And they're saying, I have to be contingent, though. Mm-hmm. Right. And how do you advise those people right now where they're saying, I need to be contingent to buy the next house? If they absolutely have to be contingent, like, I mean, they have no, like, there's no way you can get them a pre-approval letter that says they're a non-contingent buyer. Most of the time, uh, if, if they're able to bridge that gap on paper, we don't ever have to bridge that gap in real life, meaning that they buy a home today, we get their home on the market next week, and by the time they close on their new home, we have their home sold and under contract, and they boom, boom, they close the same day. So we, we usually don't have that. A lot of times, good lenders can just come up with a, a bridge loan program or a program to um, bridge that gap if they need to, to not be contingent. But I'll be honest right now, in most, in a lot of price points, not all, and in a lot of markets, not all, you can't be a contingent buyer. You just, you can't, you'll, you won't find a house. I mean, it's un, unrealistic for me to look that buyer in the eye or that seller in the eye and say, no problem, let's go in and your home isn't on the market yet, let's go in and find you a house. So I had one last week, they wanted to get their home sold and they put a caveat in there that it was subject to them finding another house within 14 days of accepting an offer. So we put their home on the market, put a contingency in there for them to protect them to find another house and uh, found them a buyer, they're under contract, they now have 14 days to go find a house or cancel the contract. So. Um, now they would be only subject to successful closing rather than contingent sale of home. So it puts them in a better position. So there's ways around it and ways we can counsel them, but it's very situational and very um, different for each person. I don't know. Do you have anything that you're advising here? Because you obviously have the same thing, right? People are coming to you and, hey, how can you get me money so I don't have to look like a weak buyer? Yeah. You know, we can't dismiss the idea for most people having two mortgage payments is super scary. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. that is literally like if you put if you laid out to them what could be one of the scariest <clears> things <throat> to enter into is having two large payments and and the one doesn't sell. Make sure that you are confident you can sell the house. Right. When they find another house if they're going to go non contingent. But yeah, that's what I'm saying. Advising so much of the market right now it's about advising them on like on a good plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, recasting is probably one of the most common things that we're doing where we're coaching a client on it. Hey, if you're buying under, say, 750 can you come up with 5% in cash down? Can we help you get a home equity line uh, on your home to be able to come up with some of that down payment money? Can you borrow it from a 401k plan that has a repayment uh, so you're not paying any penalties? Um, do you have it in cash? Can you get a gift from a family member? A lot of people have resources, mm-hmm. right? Once we start investigating into it, mm-hmm. that's where like push a button, getting a mortgage, it doesn't work. You know, yeah. we have to really look at that. Recasting is probably one of the most common where they're putting a smaller amount down, you know, five or 10% of the purchase price down. Then when they sell their home, you know, most people have a massive equity position in their house right now. They're taking that equity and then they're paying it after closing when their home has sold, their current home has sold, mm-hmm. and they're paying it down on the mortgage yep. and lowering the balance and the payment down at that time. It's yeah. a really cool way to be able to do it that minimizes cost too, keeps it pretty simple. It's not them. a refi. It's right? not a refi. Yeah. 
depending on your servicer, it's like free or mm -hmm. maybe a lot would be like 200 bucks. Yeah. So they have a mortgage payment established. Yep. But they're recasting it with that equity to establish a new mortgage payment. Correct. Without refining the property. Yeah, yep. it's a great program. Yep. I'm seeing it in uh, well-qualified clients that they actually love doing it that way because in an ideal world, what would end up happening is they go under contract on the new home they're going to purchase. You work with them on selling it, and you're able to bridge it sometimes on the other side. This is for more well-qualified clients, meaning that maybe they close two weeks after they bought the new house, so they have two weeks to move, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I know, depending on the client, the goal would really be also, the uh, another option would be where you close it before, mm -hmm. so they don't even ever have to do the recast, right? It's just making sure we lay out, like, okay, here's game plan A, B, C, yep. which one's going to work for you? So then they're leaving the, the meeting confident that they know what they're going to do. So, yeah, you use the term advising, and I think that's great. And right now, I feel my... I feel I'm advising with caution more than ever. I'm trying to take more of a long-term approach to this business more than ever than I than I have, and I, I always do that. But I think now more than ever, it's important for us to do that to make sure that we're not putting our clients in a short-term financial situation that we gave them bad advice on. So, mm -hmm. advising with caution, I think, is a very important thing to do. And in some cases, I'll look at a seller and say, "Now is not the time. Don't do it. I mean, let's don't take that risk. I can't guarantee. Nobody can guarantee that all of those dominoes will fall." And some people are more risk tolerant than others, and that's okay. So it's it's very situational. Mm -hmm. But I got to talk about something that was a really hot topic, probably about I don't know six weeks ago or so. And you're more versed on this than I am. But I saw a Fox News or a CNN story, and uh, I posted something about it on social media, and it got all lit up about um, lower credit score buyers giving a a credit versus a high credit score more secure buyer being debited or penalized. Uh, on their their mortgage and maybe talk a little bit about that and how that works just tell me what like to the give me the the 101 and what that looks like sure so what you're talking about is loan level pricing adjustments on a mortgage now the general assumption is when you qualify for a mortgage you know the say the national average rate today is 6.875 percent if you qualify you get 6.875 percent that's not the case so post financial crisis so if we're going post 2008 in order for the federal government which is the fhfa who oversees fannie mae and freddie mac which are the government agencies that back mortgages okay that's how we have a 30-year fixed rate because the federal government helps put funding for that so they came into place and started charging these fees uh, like adverse market fees loan to value if you have a lesser loan to value, maybe you're going to pay a little higher rate than someone who's got a lower loan to value or someone with a higher down payment. So they put in these fees called loan level pricing adjustments. Now, over the years, they haven't really changed much <clears throat> since the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. There's been some little nuances and changes on second homes and sure. uh, a few changes. But in general, there it's been pretty much stagnant and the same. And there was some nuances within it that didn't make a lot of sense um, that just stuck the entire time. Like, for instance, you'd get a better interest rate at 15% down than you would at 20% down. Right. So uh, there's some incentives there that, that didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, but the general idea was that the lower credit score you have, essentially the higher rate you're going to pay. Mm -hmm. Right. So and then also the other trajectory of the larger the down payment, the better rate. So even someone with low credit, but 40 percent down could get a good rate. But when you start taking the lower credit and small down payment and put them together, all of a sudden they're paying a pretty high rate. Yep. So there was some, some exclusions for income and first time home buyer. Um, but there's an update that went into place on May 1st. What okay. most people don't realize is May 1st, 2023 is it was already priced in because it was announced in January. So it already was priced in by for most lenders by March. Okay. So, and what they did is they reorganized who pays what in fees. It used to be that 740, that was the high credit. Now it's 780. Okay. So they really raised the bar on who's considered the best. And what they did was they lowered the fees. So basically they, they lowered the rate for the person with less credit 
and they charged higher fees for the person that's right in the middle. Like that 700 to 740 credit score took the brunt of the hit of increased fees or increased rate. So basically the 700 to 740, 20% down buyer now pays a quarter to three eighths of a percent higher interest rate than they did in the past. What about the person under 700? So the person under 700, it depends on the bucket, but I actually have the chart right here. Even under 700, the the one with 20% down could be paying a higher rate today than say like four months ago, which doesn't make any sense. And then they incentivized a little bit better interest rate pricing for people with 5% down. I think the idea behind it was that's the underserved group in the group that is having a hard time buying a home right now. But what they probably don't really realize is that it's because of the market that they're not able to buy a home right now because inventory is so low. So by offering them an eighth or a quarter percent better interest rate isn't going to help you win in a competitive situation. Some of these changes already got changed. There was a debt to income ratio fee that went into place depending on how much money you put down and that was already taken away because that's a really hard number to be able to establish on your debt to income ratio. I yep. got I got to stop and just beat in this this whole credit score thing cuz cool, it really burns me. Yeah. So if I got a credit score of 699 or less versus 700 or above. Mm-hmm. Tell me does that affect my interest rate? I got the chart right here. So if you have a credit score right now uh, it depends on your down payment. So if you put 10% down. Mm-hmm. And I'm a 699. It still affects your rate. It just right now, depending on. In a positive on, way? In a negative way. Okay. Okay. So the best of the best right now is going to be basically 40% down. No matter what, basically no matter what credit score you have, that's the person who qualifies f- for the best rate. And then as your down payment gets smaller and smaller, for most, your rate's going to increase. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So it's just who pays what is is the big thing that changed. But there's exclusions. This is the part that a lot of people are missing for first-time home buyers. So first-time home buyers can be omitted from this if their qualifying income is under the area median income, which is 117,800 in the majority of the Twin Cities. So we're really looking at that for each person and it is qualifying income. So there's there's some wiggle room on that that can be helpful. But overall, we, we really got to, when we're advising people, we really want to make sure that we're putting them in the right product in terms of down payment too, of where can you actually get a better rate. And some people are missing, because I can see where you're like, this is the socialism <laughs> of interest rates, right? Right, right? The people with little money down now right. get the good rates. Right. The people that right. can afford it, they're getting charged a higher rate. This seems so stupid, right? But it does. Isn't that an accurate statement, though? In some ways, yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, like, but the big thing that they changed was insured loans can get better rates than non insured loans until you get to 25% down, which some of that does make sense. Because if you have mortgage insurance on a loan, it covers 80% of the losses to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So they're basically insured for their loss. Whereas. Once mortgage insurance goes away, which is 20% down, right? It's really, the, there's been a lot of studies done for this that it's about 25% down is the, the lowest risk type borrower. So actually even 20% down isn't even the number because by the time you would, if you were to foreclose on a home, you know, by the time you pay for attorney fees, realtor fees, all of that, it's about 20% gets absorbed. So there's some reasoning behind all this of, of why they changed that they're focusing on, hey, if we have higher insurance coverage, we're less likely to get burned in terms of payouts of losses, of which right now there's almost no foreclosures. So that's kind of funny. Yeah, it just seems to me like we're trying to put higher risk borrowers, give higher risk borrowers credits and incentives to get into housing, which kind of raises a red flag to me. Like that's kind of what happened little bit pre-recession it was we were putting we had risky loans out there right so these are riskier buyers we're giving incentives to buy homes am i incorrect in saying that i mean we're encouraging and giving them the ability to uh get into some of these mortgages that maybe they wouldn't have gotten into before and they're just higher risk borrowers 
Anytime you use the word risk, I think it just scares people. Well, the frustrating part is they're changing the credit box in the background, too, through the automated underwriting systems that approve loans that for more moderate credit score borrowers are not getting approved anyway. So it's like they're they're incentivizing rates for them, yeah. but that they're changing this credit box in the background. If they even have a little bit higher debt to income ratio, they don't get approved. Hmm. So, yeah, so it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah, it's but very frustrating for all of us in the industry because the average consumer comes into us and they say, hey, I got a 720 credit right. score. I got great credit. I should get the best rates out there. And it's like, sorry, you, you don't. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. Just about anything government sticks their fingers into it doesn't make sense, does it? Well, anything decreasing <laughs> affordability right now is not good. Yeah. We're already in an affordability crisis in terms of home ownership. It's it's tough right now. Yeah. Right. So that brings me to the next question, kind of wrap it all up with this. What What's your prediction? What's going to happen the next, just in housing, not interest rates, just where does the housing market take us over the next six months, second half of this year? I think a big picture, we're at the bottom of the market. So in terms of unit sales, and I think that there's been so many homeowners that have been waiting to buy that regardless of rate, now they're absorbing, okay, this is the, the where the rate market is. The home values today in June of 2023, for most places, it doesn't, they don't appear to be down, right? Like, Do you and, think they'll continue to go up? Yeah, I, I really do. Over the next six, 12 months? Yes. So I think we'll have our normal season of guess. 5%. Over the next 12 months? Yeah, 4 or 5%. I really do. I think that we're already seeing it. And a lot of that price point is established, or that, that jump is established in the summer markets, right? Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then here, you know, October, November, December, January, it slows down and then increases again. But I, my prediction would be in a year from now that we're going to see higher home values than today to unleash uh, more buyers in the marketplace with rate decreases yeah. and also inventory so low with and demand is still far exceeding inventory I think that we're gonna we'll start seeing there's so many people that have sat on the mark on the sidelines for so long mm-hmm. at some point in time they still they still are getting divorced they still are having you know uh, their first child mm-hmm. their second or their mm-hmm. third mm-hmm. or a new job or the baby boomer that has been sitting in their house for years saying that we really want to move to that villa or rambler Mm -hmm. you know town home but we've been waiting we've been waiting Mm -hmm. like then time's ticking and they're going to be ready to go that's what i think my prediction is the bottom of housing sales has either happened or we're in it and it's going to increase we're still going to have the bell curve of sales here in the twin cities but i think 2023 is the bottom. And I think for those of us, you know, as salespeople in our industry, it's a it's uphill from here for the next five years. I hope you're right. I'm not as confident in the market as you are. I, uh, I think there's too much volatility in the overall economy, not only nationally, but globally. And I think there's just things that could negatively affect housing. And if you even want to drill that down into the state, I just think um, we've got some things here that are going to potentially drive people out of our state for tax reasons and a variety of other things. And they have the flexibility to live in other states and work in other states. And I think locally here, I think we'll see a subtle decline in home values over the next 12 months. You do? Yep, I do. I do. Okay. Uh, I think inventory will pick up. And as inventory picks up, buyers will have more to choose from. Um, I think, I've said this before, but I think we had two and a half years worth, or excuse me, seven years worth of Home buyers buy homes in two and a half years because interest rates are so so low. So there's just not going to be as many buyers out there. There's going to be as sellers uh, continue to, as inventory continues to pick up, and as um, I guess the interest rates continues to stay where they are. I think it's going to keep people on the sidelines, and I just I I don't see how home values continue to increase the way they're increasing, and a first-time home buyer continues to afford a home on the salaries they're making, on average. Mm-hmm. It's my opinion. Something's got to give. One of us is going to be right. <laughs> uh, I hope it's you, and I hope it's not me. Um, but I think things will soften here in the next, uh, for sure, the next second half of this year. Um, next year, I've said this before, I'll say it again, I'm repeating myself, we'll get saved by an election. Election years are usually good. You, you touched on that. Mm-hmm. That's the one thing that might save things from going from um, you know, depreciating 10% to maybe only 1% or 2%. Yeah, so, I think if we get in the fours, like if we get interest that'll rates. That'll change in- exactly what I, everything I just said will go out the door if we get into the fours. If we get in the fours with interest rates, um, we'll see an increase in home values. Yeah, absolutely, because you're going to see someone mm-hmm. 
that has three and a quarter yep. on their rate, yep. they'll say, I'll go to 4.75. For sure. Like, I feel very comfortable with that, yep. right? Like, like I can handle that. Three, to, three to seven is a lot different than three to four. It is. Yeah. 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 There's the psychological side of it. Yeah. Not only monthly payments, just the psychological side of giving up this really, really affordable payment, or so many people are moving out of there. They're renting their current home, which holds inventory back from the market, too. So, but at the end of the day, people need to buy, people need to sell in any economy. Um, it's our job to uh, counsel them, guide them, and provide them, like you said, with um, their options and their guidance. And it's hard for me to watch some of these realtors try to predict uh, home values continue to go up and they could do this, um, what do they say, marry the house, date the rate, all that good stuff. It's kind of a common thing I'm hearing out there. And if home values do dip, they're not going to be able to refi and, and, and get into a new rate and date, date another rate. So who knows? That's a long long discussion we could go on for hours on that and i think this can be it's going to be a state to state rather than nationally and we're still seeing home values go up i think in states like florida arizona texas where they've dropped i think 30 percent in new york and california so mm -hmm. we'll see i think we're more of a new york and a california than we are in arizona and in texas but we can talk politics off off camera so, yeah so i got um, a question for you mm -hmm. so when the seller is coming to you right now how do they feel that the market is what like what are they when they're coming to you saying hey I need to mm -hmm. sell my home, you know uh, what 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 is their general stigma between hearing the news, hearing it from their friends, wh how do they feel the real estate market is when they're coming to talk to you? A lot of them are saying let's get out now before things get worse. So and a lot of them are very smart, much smarter than me, businessmen, uh, business owners, entrepreneurs, CEOs, CFOs, um, that. Our, I had one come to me last week. He's selling a house for 1.2 million, simply moving over the border. He said, "I, well, I just won't. I, I can't. The taxes in the state. I just can't afford it anymore. So, mm -hmm. and I won't pay it anymore." So, when you hear people like 3M just lost 6,000 jobs, something like that, um, it's tax revenue gone. We're gonna have to make up that tax revenue at some point. It's, it's there's a there's a bigger picture that I think people are forgetting about just supply and demand. Supply and demand is a great thing to talk about, and that's out of balance right now. Um, but there's things that will affect that and balance that out that I don't think are being brought into the picture, into the forefront that my clients are talking about. And I'm just fortunate that I am able to associate myself with some really smart people. So, but we'll see. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you taking the time and having this conversation. And um, I hope uh, you'll do it again. And I hope a year from now you can sit here and you can say you were right and I was wrong. Uh, that's my goal, but we'll see. So. Cool. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks. Yeah.